Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today for July 23rd, 2021. Glad that you are with me today. Let's go ahead and get started. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Gracious God, we give you thanks that through the gift of our baptism, you have embraced us as your own and made us one in Christ's body. By the power of your Holy Spirit, continue to nourish and strengthen us in the ways of faith, hope, and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are Psalm 130 and 148. 1 Samuel 31, 1 through 13, Acts 15, 12 through 21, and Mark 5, 21 through 43. Listen for God's word to speak to you. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in God's hope, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with God is great power to redeem. It is God who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Psalm 148 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all God's angels. Praise God, all God's hosts. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise God, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God commanded, and they were created. God established them forever and ever. God fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling God's command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God's name alone is exalted. God's glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for God's people. Praise for all God's faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to God. Praise the Lord. First reading is for Samuel 31, 1 through 13. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines, and many fell at Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, and Abinadab, and Melchushiah, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard upon Saul. The archers found him, and he was badly wounded by them. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword, and thrust me through with it, so that these uncircumcised may not come and thrust me through, and make sport of me. But his armor-bearer was unwilling, for he was terrified. So Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men died together on the same day. When the men of Israel, who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their towns and fled, and the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen at Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, 
and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the houses of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Astarte, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shen. But when the inhabitants of Jebesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men set out, traveled all night long, and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan. They came to Jibbish and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jibbish and fasted for seven days. Acts fifteen twelve through 21 The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name, God's name. This agrees with the words of the prophet as it is written, After this I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from the things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in their synagogues. And from Mark five twenty one through 43. When Jesus had crossed again to the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jarius came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a loud, large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she fell on, felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do you fear? Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years old of of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our readings for today. The, uh, the epic or the story of Saul comes to an end. Um, he has led to this huge battle, uh, partially because of his own hubris. Um, this Philistine army is large and in charge partially because he has not really dealt with the Philistines at all during his time. He spent most of his time chasing after David. The battle, just as, the, as Samuel had told him when he was resurrected by a witch, goes very poorly. And all of Saul's sons and Saul himself dies. Um, Saul actually kills himself because he was struck by an arrow, and his armor bearer would not kill him, and so he fell on his own sword, and the armor bearer fell on his sword. And the Philistines take his body and, and put it up on the wall, which is um, an incredibly disgraceful place um, to put a body. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly rude um, to do this. Um, and so there's, there are some men who travel all through the night so they can go and take him and, and the sons down under a cover of night, presumably, and they burn him to burn them to give them a proper burial and bury their bones uh, under a particular tree. So this is the end of the uh, Saul dynasty. But it's certainly not the end of the story. We will, this is um, very close to the end of 1 Samuel. We'll now pick up with 2 Samuel and see what David does from, from here on. So that's, that's where that is. Then we have um, from Acts. We are continuing this, uh, this council of Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas tell all about all the things that have happened among the Gentiles, how they have received the gospel, and James stands up and it is very sort of downplayed in the in the narrative here but this is a huge move james has been one of the primary most outspoken proponents that the gentile believers do absolutely positively need to take on the law they need to be circumcised they need to become jewish in order to be saved by the jewish messiah he is unrelenting he is sending people to all the places where, where um, Paul and Barnabas are raising up churches, he's sending Jewish uh, ambassadors to say, great, we're so happy that you have become Christian, you have believe in Jesus, but you have to do all of these other things. James, as far as we can tell, was the sort of the person who was really driving this movement. He gets up and he says, you know what? I was wrong. I see how God is at work. I see that from, from hearing from Peter and from Paul and from Barnabas what God is doing and faced with the evidence of what God is doing rather than what we're necessarily comfortable with or we're assuming that God is doing to see what God is actually doing I have no other choice but to say, you know what? The Gentile believers do not have to take on the law. We should send them a letter, <laughs> right? Um, maybe, I don't, I don't know. It, let's send a letter and, and let everybody know that these are the standards. We're going to have some very minimal standards. There's a few things that we'd like them to abstain from, but they don't have to take on the whole law. They don't have to be circumcised. This is a very, very big move on the part of the, the leadership of the early church. They decide that these standards um, that they were holding up here high, and, and, and as Peter so eloquently said, we could not live up to these standards, so why would we expect others to do so? To say, okay, there are a few things we would like you to do or like you not to do, but other than that, you as well as we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. It's a, it's, I cannot um, sort of overstate how huge this is, how uh, uh, consequential this decision, how, uh, how 
much it affects the early church. Um, it sat, now sets the trajectory. Now, we have seen all, th- all the way through Acts, this is not a surprise. There are all sorts of things in the book of Acts that are saying, this is where this is going. God is pouring out not only the Holy Spirit, but also grace upon all. And so it's, it's really James kind of getting with the program and seeing what God is doing. But anyways, then we have from Mark this wonderful story. Jesus comes across the, the lake. Remember, he was um, shooed off by the Gerasenes. He comes to the other side of the lake. There's a, a town there. There's a huge crowd, as always. But there's this man, Jairus, who is uh, the leader of a synagogue. He has privilege. He ha- is used to people listening to him, and he comes, and he has to humble himself. He has to say, you know what? I don't have the answers here. I can't do anything. Jesus, you're my last hope. Would you help me? So Jesus goes with him. And as he's going, we have this really interesting sort of side story where there's a woman in the crowd and and she reaches out to his cloak. She knows that if she just touches his cloak, she will be healed. She's been hemorrhaging. She's, She's been having a menstrual flow for 12 years. Imagine how not only physically, but also psychologically taxing that would be, especially in a culture where you are, because of that, you are unclean. You cannot touch anyone or else they are unclean. You cannot touch anything unless, or it will be unclean. She would have to hide herself away. And yet she takes this risk. And Jesus says, stop, power has gone out of me. Someone has touched me. And his disciples say, well, of course, everybody has touched you. We're in this huge crowd. But he takes this time, right? He's following this important person, Jairus, but he stops and he waits. He wants to make sure that this is taken care of. She comes to him. She she fesses up. She says, this is what I have done. And he does not scold her. He does not, you know, tell her that she's done something wrong. He wanted to stop to make sure that she knew you have been cleansed. You are healed. Go. Be at peace. She goes. Her life is changed forever. And about that time, Jarvis gets this news that his daughter is dead. It's now past the point of no return. There's no reason to bother the master anymore, but Jesus goes anyways. And he sends everybody out and raises her from the dead. Talitha Kum, little girl, get up, and she does. Despite the, the doubts of all the people who have gathered to grieve, she is awake. She is restored to her father, Jairus. And it's, you know, it's a happy ending. This, it's, it's a great story and a really interestingly told story. It's about the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. It is a restoring of life and a restoring of life. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Anyways, let's go ahead and join together in prayer. Satisfy us with, with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. God of all mercies, we praise you that you have brought us to this new day, brightening our lives with the dawn of promise and hope in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for ministries of discernment and governance. Those who teach and those who learn. the community of faith in your church. Reconciliation in our relationships. All gifts of healing and forgiveness. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? 
We give thanks for uh, Vacation Bible School that we are putting together right now. We thank God for all of the 40 or so, a little bit more, children, all the many volunteers who are going to be joining us and learning more about God's work and will. We pray that they would have a a blessing, that they would see more about who God is. Merciful God, strengthen us in our prayer that we may lift up the brokenness of this world for your healing and share in the saving love of Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for the church in Europe. Safe, clean, and renewable energy. Those who are lonely and forgotten. Those from whom we are estranged. All who glorify you in worship and service. People of God, for what else do we pray? We pray for Miss Debbie, who fell and broke a couple of ribs. She is continuing to recover from hip replacement. Also, uh, David fell in the shower and um, had to have some stitches on his head. We pray for Marianne, a friend of Bill's, who has some dizziness. For Kathy a friend of Jan Ann's who has a broken tibia. For Margaret, who's on IV antibiotics for an infection in her jawbone. For Robin, a friend of the Garlands and the Wises who is recovering from a serious stroke. For Brad, a friend of the Wises who is recovering from brain surgery. Also prayers for his wife, Ashley, and son, Anthony. For Sophia, as she continues to interview, and apply for employment. We pray for Mike, a friend of Cheryl's who's been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Fran, a a friend of Amy's who has a sudden hearing, hearing loss in one ear. And for Renna, another friend of Amy's who has breast cancer. Also pray for her two young children. For all of these many things and all of the other things that we have on our hearts and minds, we pray that you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Eternal God, you are the source of every gift and the fountain of all blessing. Give us such joy in living and such peace in serving Christ that we may gratefully make use of all your blessing and joyfully seek our risen Lord in everyone we meet. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, so far as it depends on us, let us live peaceably with all. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Like this video, share it with someone else, click on the subscription and the notification button, as well as going to our website, johncalvinchurch.org, for more information. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA 2018 edition, and our readings came from the New Revised Standard Version and the Daily Lectionary Reading. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a blessed day. We'll see you next time. Bye.